In this video, we're going to discuss the first law of thermodynamics. Now, in order to discuss the first law of thermodynamics, we need to introduce a quantity called the internal energy. So internal energy is just the energy associated with the uh, random motions and vibrations and whatnot that can happen to molecules, right? So it's associated with the motion of molecules. And we use the letter U, so a capital U, to denote internal energy. Now, as far as this calculation, you're more or less familiar with this idea of energy being a sum of kinetic and potential contributions. And that's exactly what the internal energy is as well. So the internal energy is just a sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So I'll denote kinetic energy as Ke and potential energy as Pe. And internal energy is just a sum of both of those uh, components. Now, if we assume an ideal gas, remember that one of the assumptions of the ideal gas law is that the molecules don't interact with one another, right? We're assuming they're just billiard balls, they bounce around and they hit each other, but there's no energy between them. There's no potential energy of their interaction. So what that means is that for an ideal gas, right, PE is going to be equal to zero. Right, so for an ideal gas, this potential energy is going to be equal to zero. So the internal energy is only going to depend on the kinetic energy contribution. So this simplifies our equations greatly, right? And it simplifies our discussion of internal energy. Now, in one of the very first videos, I mentioned uh, something called the equipartition theorem from statistical mechanics. And it introduced something called the degrees of freedom that are available uh, to a molecule or to a particle, right? So uh, we basically define um, the internal energy using this, these degrees of freedom. So U is going to be equal to the degrees of freedom divided by 2 times nRT, right? So this DF is the degrees of freedom. And this is going to depend on the identity of your gas particles, uh, particularly their molecular shape. Uh, but this is the, more or less the equation for internal energy. U is going to be equal to the degrees of freedom over 2. Now, the degrees of freedom in this case are either going to be associated with translational motion or rotational motion. Now, for a monatomic gas, think about this. If you rotate a monatomic, um, just a single atom, right? If, it's, if we're approximating it as a sphere, it's going to be spherically symmetric all the way around. So if you rotate it, there's no change in its representation, right? So you rotate an atom, it's spherically symmetric. So it doesn't matter where you rotate it or which axis you rotate it around. Um, it's going to have the same representation. So that means that a monatomic gas will only have three degrees of freedom, right? So for a monatomic gas, DF would be equal to three. And so that means that your internal energy is going to be three halves nRT, right? So this will be your internal energy for a monatomic gas because it only has three degrees of freedom, the three degrees associated with its translational motion. Now, as we start to look at more complicated molecules, they begin to have more degrees of freedom. So let's take the case of a linear molecule and let's know that our, our axis system. So um, the horizontal axis is X, vertical is Y, and coming in and out of the board is gonna be Z. So, um, or I guess coming in and out of the screen for you guys' perspective. So, uh, so for a linear molecule, uh, we're going to have two additional degrees of freedom. If you rotate it around the y-axis, right? So let's say you define this axis and you pull a rotation around that axis, right? That's going to give you a unique representation for each time you rotate it, right? Also, if you rotate it around the z-axis, right? So this is the axis coming in and out of the screen, right? You rotate around that axis, you also get a unique representation of the molecule rotating it around that axis. However, you do not get a unique representation rotating around the x-axis, right? Because you're just rotating it. It's kind of similar to when you rotate the atom. You don't really change 
um, the molecule's representation by rotating it that way. So you end up with two additional degrees of freedom. So in this case, for a linear gas, the degrees of freedom would be five. So that would give you the internal energy expression of five halves nRT. Okay, so now for a nonlinear gas, you have the three translational degrees of freedom. You have those two translational, those two rotational degrees of freedom around the y and the z axis, but you also have an additional uh, rotational degree of freedom around the x axis as well, right? If you rotate around that axis, you also change the representation of the molecule. So in this case, df is going to be equal to six, right? You're going to have six total degrees of freedom. And for the internal energy for this guy, that would just be 3 nRT, right? So, uh, so these are going to be your differing uh, internal energy expressions based on whether your gas is monatomic, linear, or nonlinear. Now, the first law of thermodynamics deals with this concept of internal energy. And basically, uh, it says that energy cannot be created nor destroyed, right? So that's the statement of the first law of thermodynamics. So inherently, it deals with an energy change, right? It's basically saying that your delta U, right, is going to be, it, uh, it can't be created nor de destroyed. It has to be transferred, right? So that's kind of what I always like to add that to the first law of thermodynamics statement. Energy can't be created nor destroyed. It can only be transferred. And it can be transferred through two mechanisms. One is heat, which we use the lowercase q to define heat, and work, which I use the lowercase uh, w. Kind of looks like an omega. Let me do w there. Right? So uh, q plus w. So you can only transfer energy in the form of heat and work. Right. So that's that's the whole statement of the first law of thermodynamics. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Uh, it can only be transferred. OK. And this will lead to a differential expression as well. So you could also have uh, du is equal to dq plus dw. Right. So you can also have a, a differential version of that expression as well. Right. So, um, so yeah, so this is a statement of the first law, mathematical statement of the first law of thermodynamics. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the sign conventions for Q and W uh, for heat and work. So these can be positive or negative numbers, um, and they're going to mean something different in both cases, right? So let me go to a new slide here. So let's say, for example, we have a positive Q, right? So if we have a positive Q, that means that the system is gaining heat, right? So positive Q, we are gaining heat. For a negative Q, that means that the system is losing heat. Right. And so this always depends on what you define as the system. Right. So kind of going back to our you know, original video on defining thermodynamic systems, whatever you define as the system is going to influence the signs of these uh, of heat and work. Right. If the system is gaining heat, you'll end up with a positive Q. And if it's negative Q, that means that the system is losing heat heat. And a good way to think about this is to kind of think about these as, as total changes, right? If your system is gaining heat, then, you know, the total change is going to be, you know, the total change of some variable is final minus initial. If you're gaining heat, that means your, you know, final heat value would be greater than your initial heat value. So that means there will be a positive number. Same thing with losing heat. Your final heat will be lower. So that would be a negative number. So um, now for work. So positive work. Now, if W is positive, 
then this means that work is done on the system. So this is work done on the system. And by contrast, if you have a negative W, then that mean, means work was done by the system. So work done by the system. So these are your sign conventions for Q and W. Now for, for work, I like to try to remember this um, by thinking of the system being lazy, right? Let's say the system is, uh, you know, it just doesn't want to do anything, doesn't want to work, right? So um, it's happy, you know, positive outcome is work being done on the system, right? Versus um, if it has to do work, that's a negative outcome. It's not happy with that. So work done by the system is going to be negative. So that's just a way to, to remember it. Obviously, the thermodynamics behind why this is positive and negative is more, you know, physical than that. But that's just if you're trying to remember these, these sign conventions for work and heat, respectively. Those are just simple ways to do it. OK, so um, so this was just a short introduction to the first law of thermodynamics and kind of an, an initial discussion um, of heat and work. So a, a fundamental understanding of these two properties is going to be very important uh, for everything that we define in this class. So make sure you understand this um, as best you can and we'll go into more details with what uh, heat and work are and how we can use them.